All right, so welcome everybody, welcome everyone online, and just uh, if I talk fast today, I'm still have not recovered quite yet from this morning. We were leaving to come to church, and there was a, uh, of course I'm preaching, so it's going to be exaggerated a little bit, but uh, it was probably about a four-foot snake or so in our garage, so, <laughs> so we were already running late, and so anyway, we get... <laughs> I look and like, we, we, we saw, yesterday we had this snake on our front porch and we were just going, oh my gosh. In the front porch is not that, it's not good, but it's not bad. But we're, it's in the garage, so we're just, I mean, I, if you, man, I hate snakes. I just totally hate snakes. There's some people that love snakes, that so don't bother them. I'm not one of those guys, I mean, it was freaking me out. And so, you know, Angie's yelling at me, I'm yelling at her, Anna's just going, ah, it was all panicked and... I didn't know how, think, you know, we told mom to start praying and, you know, dad too, but mainly mom. And uh, anyway, all of a sudden, this snake started slithering away. And so I was getting the broomstick and beating the kayak in the garage. And it, it, I don't know, I, I, I tried to get the broom to sweep it away, but it started moving too fast. And I was thinking, yeah, that's going to freak us out. So anyway, if my heart is racing, it still feels like it's racing. If I'm talking fast, it's probably not the anointing. It's the adrenaline that's still on me from that experience. But anyway, so I, I, you know, I haven't preached in about two months, um, and I've almost forgotten even what to do and how to do it. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 1. And today we are celebrating Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Passover. And uh, it's very important for us to always remember the power of the Holy Spirit and what God did in that first Pentecost Sunday as a church of Jesus Christ as they gathered together and the Holy Spirit was poured out with power. And so we're coming today to celebrate Pentecost, the way God started the church and the power of God that came on the church for the church to be an effective witness of Jesus Christ. I mean, have you ever thought about this? If anyone could, could persuade the masses to come to Jesus Christ by an argument, it would be the 12 apostles. They were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. They beheld him 40 days after his, res after his resurrection. 40 days he appeared to them and proclaimed to them the kingdom of God. I mean, they were putting their fingers into his hole marks, they, uh, uh, nail marks. They saw him face to face in the appearing of Jesus Christ. If anyone could win the masses over to Jesus Christ by an argument, it was the 12. Yet God said, you need power to be my witness. If they needed power in the first century to be the witness of Jesus Christ, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit's power to be a witness of Jesus Christ? And so Pentecost is really about Remembering what God did on that first Pentecost Sunday as the church, as they gathered, it probably wasn't on a Sunday, but as they gathered together as the ecclesia, waiting for what the Lord had promised, the Lord answered and poured out his power, poured out his spirit. Now, I love what, if you turn to Acts chapter 1, I love what Luke said in Acts chapter 1. This is, this is, this is an amazing scripture verse. I want you to catch this. This is, this is so amazing what Luke said. The, the first account, Luke's writing, the first account I composed, Theopolis, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now catch that right there. Jesus has, had ascended by the time Luke wrote this. All that Jesus began to do and teach. The ministry of Jesus Christ is extended through the church baptized with the Holy Spirit's power. See, we are meant to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ as his ecclesia. Jesus said, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. The ministry of Jesus, all that he began to do and teach, is carried out through the church of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that's what Pentecost is about. And so there's four things that I want to talk about today about remembering Pentecost, Pentecost power. Um, there's four things. I'll just quickly say them and we'll go through them in more detail. That Pentecost reminds us to live from the indwelling Holy Spirit. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
Live, and we'll get into this in a minute, live from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Number two, Pentecost reminds us to rekindle the gifts of the Holy Spirit because those gifts can go dormant and to receive fresh baptisms of the Holy Spirit so that we can be an effective witness for Jesus Christ. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not for charismatic entertainment. Okay? It's not for charismatic entertainment. The, the Holy Spirit does not pour it out so we charismatics can have a fun, entertaining service. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is poured out so we can be a witness of Jesus Christ and to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ from what he left, that we could minister like him in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not for charismatic entertainment. It's to be an effective witness of Jesus Christ. If the apostles needed his power, how much more do we need his power to be that witness? And so Pentecost reminds us, a lot of us have already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. A lot of us have been received gifts of the Holy Spirit. But like we were singing about today, is passivity or indifference or lukewarmness has caused those, the fire of those gifts to become like an ember. And those gifts need to be restirred. So we're going to talk about that. That's the second one. The third thing Pentecost reminds us is that the church of Jesus Christ to receive corporate power, that corporate power can only be received as the church gathers. And we'll talk about that. And then the fourth one is Pentecost reminds us the Holy Spirit's power is the only solution to the division that is taking place in the world right now. His power is the only solution. I mean, the world is, if you haven't noticed, sharply divided over race and politics and religion and culture. And, you know, just I mean, we are living in such a divided time. Pentecost tells us the curse of Babel is reversed at Pentecost because the Holy Spirit's power comes and they all spoke the same language. And so we'll get into that here in this message. But the first thing we're going to go into a little deeper is... Number one, Pentecost reminds us to live from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul asked the Corinthians, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells within you? Now that is an odd question if you think about it to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were already moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's where... You know, people call them the carnal Corinthians, and they were still moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Paul did not discourage them, even in their carnality, to stop operating the gifts. He actually encouraged them to keep doing it. Now, he wanted them to live by the Spirit of God so they would not be carnal. But it's so interesting that Paul is looking at the Corinthian church who's moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he says, wait, do you not know the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? That was an odd question. You would think that would be the last. Of course they know. They're ministering in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But Paul said, no, he's not just present when you gather. He's in you. And as I look at the, the church of Jesus Christ today, I believe one of the greatest problems we have is we have amnesia, spiritual amnesia, and we forget who we are. We forget that living on the inside of us is God, the Holy Spirit. This does not make us a God, but it does make us godly. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells inside of you. The same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Think about that. And don't ever stop thinking about that. Don't ever get over that. Don't ever get over that incredible revelation that Paul said, if Christ is in you, the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. That is a, an amazing statement. <laughs> dead raising power is inside of you. Power that raises dead things to life is inside of you. You think about the resurrection. You think about the apostles when they, before they had this power in them and before they had this power on them, the apostles where, in, you know, Peter especially, he was intimidated by a lowly slave girl. He, was, he, de he, de he denied Jesus Christ in front of the slave girl. You think about this. But then after the resurrection, 
these, these, uh, these men who were intimidated, these men who were so uh, afraid became these bold witnesses that turned the world upside down. The resurrection of Jesus Christ turned the first century world upside down. But the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection power of Christ in you turns your world right side up. You have the power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. And then Peter could stand up and say to the people who had the authority to put him into prison and kill him, he said to them, you killed the Messiah. I mean, think about that transformation he went through from being this intimidated man by a slave girl that had no power to standing up in front of the most powerful Jewish leaders of his day and saying, you killed the Messiah. It was the power of God in him and on him that gave him that boldness to speak in such a way. See, you have the power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. Think about that. Don't ever stop thinking about that. Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Memorize that verse. Sing that verse. Don't pray that verse. Meditate on that verse until that verse becomes the very revelation that moves you. Think about this. The very revelation Paul had when he wrote Romans chapter 8 verse 11 is meant to be the very revelation you have and you live from. The power of the resurrection is in you. Not only is the power of the resurrection in you, but also the very Spirit of God who hovered over creation and created at the words and the commands of Jesus Christ now dwells in you. You have creative power in you. You have power for ability in you. Live from that power. That's what Pentecost reminds us of. Pentecost reminds us that we are to live from the indwelling Holy Spirit, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. The second thing that Pentecost reminds us of is that we're to rekindle the gifts of the Spirit and receive fresh baptisms of the Spirit. Now, I want to say this in case you don't understand this, this concept, that there is a difference between the indwelling Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think they're the same. They're not. And I can, I'm going to show it to you through Scripture. In John chapter 20, verse 22 Right after the resurrection, Jesus gathered his apostles together and he breathed upon them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just like God did in the garden with Adam when he breathed upon him and that dust became a living soul. When Jesus breathed upon the apostles, the apostles became a, alive in their spirit because the Holy Spirit came to dwell in them at that moment. And you can go back and read it for yourself. They had the Holy Spirit in them before Pentecost. Now Pentecost comes, and Jesus said, Go and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, for I will baptize you with Holy, the Holy Spirit and with power, and you will be my witnesses. And if you read it closely, it says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. There's a difference between the indwelling Holy Spirit who is in you, and that would be true for anyone who's born of the Spirit. Baptist, charismatic, Pentecostal, Catholic, that's truly born of the Spirit. Methodist, whatever the denomination is. If you've been born of the Spirit, if you have been regenerated in your human spirit, then you have the indwelling Holy Spirit has been grafted to your spirit. That's true of everyone. If that's not true of you, you're not a Christian. You're not going to heaven. Now, what's not true of everyone is not everyone has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit is to enable you and to empower you to live the life of Jesus Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is to empower you by his anointing coming upon you to, be, to carry out the ministry of Jesus Christ. So you see the difference. The indwelling spirit is meant for you to live the, the life of Jesus Christ. 
live his, live, produce his fruit, produce his character, the fruit of the Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is meant to give you power to be his minister by preaching the Word of God with boldness, by operating in miracles, the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, signs, wonders, and miracles. And we need both. We don't, have, listen, we don't have to make a decision like, well, I just want the fruit of the Spirit. I would rather have the fruit of the Spirit than the power of the Spirit. You don't, God does not give you a choice. You want both. He, he gives us both. We need both. We need the indwelling Holy Spirit and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I had an interesting conversation recently with some ministers who were, I would call them uh, non-charismatics. And um, to be honest, I've been so out of the loop of, of being around non-charismatic ministers, I had forgotten the, I don't know what the word would be, the dislike they have for charismatics. And so we were just talking and, you know, we were just hanging out. And I, was, I was honestly just looking forward to a good conversation, like, hey, you're pastors, I'm a pastor, we'll just, you know, talk about, like, you know, Story, you know, war stories or whatever, but somehow it came out that I'm a charismatic pastor, and I mean, it was like the microphone dropped. It was like you could hear the drop of a pen, and it, I mean, it, the whole conversation shifted in an instant, and I felt like I was being one of those inquisitions where they're questioning me, like, now tell me, you know, and, and so, I, I mean, it was really the strangest thing. All of a sudden, this guy's voice, it was just a normal voice before, conversational tone, and all of a sudden, it just quickly shifted, and it's like, now tell me, I heard that charismatics have a prophecy mic in every one of their services. And I'm like, a, a what? A prophecy mic? What is a prophecy mic? And so, anyway, and another one of them said, well, we just value the fruit of the Spirit above the, the gifts of the Spirit. Like, I don't value the, the fruit of the Spirit. So, Anyway, it just got really weird, and all of a sudden, the conversation ended, and I was like, oh, man, I actually love these kind of things. By the way, I love getting into debates like this, so I was like, oh, man. On the way home, I, we were, I, was, I was driving home. On the way home, I don't know if you've seen the Christmas story where Ralphie envisions, like, him writing this paper, and he's going to get, you know, the teacher goes on the blackboard, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, and he gets, like, a C+. Plus. But I was envisioning on the way home, this, my answers to this, these, these ministers, and I, man, my arguments were incredible. They were, in my mind, they were going to say, like, never have such persuasive words of wisdom come from the lips of a mere mortal. I mean, I was sitting there just like, I mean, I had this, like, thing so built up in my head, and I was like, I mean, I'll just share some of you, some of the thoughts I had, but I was thinking, okay, the first thing I would say is the reason I'm a charismatic is because I see it in Scripture. I am, I am Scripture first. And so because I see it in Scripture, that's why I'm a charismatic. Show me one verse in Scripture that says the gifts of the Spirit have passed away. Okay, I'm waiting. You know, and they're like, wow, Brother Kessler, we can't find one verse of Scripture that says that. Wow, you have persuaded us. And then I would say, and then, you know, I had an answer to the typical non-charismatic rebuttal. But then, then, uh, then anyway, so then I would think about, okay, not only would I say that about the Scriptures, I would start sharing the experiences that I've had, the, you know, what I've seen with my eyes. Now, to their defense, us charismatics have given them a lot of fodder to work with. <laughs> And some of our craziness in the charismatic movement and some of the stuff that we have gotten off track with in the charismatic movement, the gifts of the Spirit and, and some of the things we say of the Lord are just nonsense. It's just pure soul or pure flesh or even demonic that we prize and we, we talk about and we value. We've given them a lot of stuff to work with. So, you know, I understand in some degree why they would have that, that feeling towards us. But I started thinking through, okay, the first thing I would tell them, okay, just as, this is just some of my own experiences. The first thing I would tell them is, okay, I had a dream back in 1997 where John the Baptist spoke to me in a dream. And John the Baptist spoke to me and he said, the Father loves the Son. And that's all he spoke. And I just remember waking up, and I'm, I mean, that was back, that was years ago. I didn't know anything and the next day, I remember, I can remember this vividly. It was 1997. I was in Publix eating a sub. The next day, I look, and I'm opening the, to read what John the Baptist said. And in John, I think it's John 3, verse 20, he said, The Father loves the Son. 
I was like, I had no idea John the Baptist had ever said that. And I started thinking through, okay, I, I could list different stories. I just say, okay, well, here's another story. Back when I'm first beginning, I don't know anything, we had a minister come into our church from Australia, and he gave me a scripture verse that said, basically, you're called to be a messenger to the nations. And he gave me the scripture verse, Jeremiah 1 something. Uh, to, about two or three weeks later, Another minister from Australia, and by the way, they don't talk, so this is not like they like, hey, I got this word for Brian. Why don't you go when you go when you go there? Give him the same scripture verse, and it'll really wow the crowd. Uh, anyway, they don't do that, and so anyway, this other minister came and gave me the exact same scripture verse, and I'm sitting there going, man, you know, you just can't, you cannot make that up. You can't make that up. And then I was thinking, okay, well, I've got, I've got all these. These Jeff Burke stories. I don't know if you, some of you remember Jeff Burke, but Jeff Burke used to come here a long time ago. The, the most accurate minister in personal prophecy I've ever seen in my life. And uh, I just would start telling them, okay, well, what about this? How do, you, how do you argue this? I invite Jeff to come. And we did a youth service. And the, this girl's name, I'm going to, say her last name because it makes, just to help, help you understand the story, her last name was Berger. And what had, ha what, what had happened in her life is kids in her school, I think she was probably in high school, kids in her school used to make fun of her and say, hamburger, hamburger, hamburger. And they would just put wounds into her by, by making fun of her last name. It just wounded her, her spirit with rejection. And Jeff began to prophesy over her, not knowing anything. I asked him afterwards. I'm very skeptical about this stuff. So I was asked him afterwards. But he said, he started prophesying over her. And he said, the Lord says to you, even when they were saying hamburger, 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 the Lord saw that and he's healing you right now. Instantly, she went down and broke down in sobbing. God healed her heart in one instant. I would have told these non-charismatic pastors, a thousand eloquent sermons, a thousand demonstrations of you going through perfectly interpreting scripture and preaching the most incredibly eloquent sermons could not have healed this girl's heart like that one word from God did. And I would have said that this is exactly what 1 Corinthians 14 says, that if a prophet comes and he speaks the word, of the, Lord of God, the word of the Lord to you, the secrets of your heart are revealed and you fall down and worship God, then you say, certainly God is among you. And I said, you can't get that. Just and I, Listen, I love the word of God. <laughs> the word of God is so precious to me. But you, cannot, you could not have gotten that healing, that instantaneous healing without the, the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, moving in her life in such a way to bring freedom and healing. And so I would have told him that. I got to ride with, uh, Jeff invited me one time. This is back in my mid-20s. He invited me to travel with him up to Tennessee. We went to a Nazarite church. I mean, of all things, you would think, I didn't think they were open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we went to this Nazarite church. I just remember... It's pretty funny. I just remember walking or riding with Jeff in the car, and it was, and I'm like mid 20s, and he's, I don't even remember, 40. I don't know how old he was then, but he was quite a number of years older than me, and it was the most awkward thing. You know, I'm sitting here, I'm like, he probably knows every thought I'm going to say before I speak it. I mean, he had a, he had a, I mean, seriously, he had an, a, an amazing ability to prophesy words of knowledge that were stunningly accurate. And so, and I'm sitting there going, okay. What do I talk about? You know, football. I mean, he was an Auburn fan, so we talked some football. But I mean, I just remember that being like, what do I say to this guy? <laughs> anyway, so I remember where, you know, he's Jeff is ministering at this church, and it was just, I just, I'll never forget this. He started prophesying over this couple, and he told them the exact conversation they had on Interstate 40. He said, I saw you on Interstate 40, and you, the wife, you were saying this, and the husband, you were saying this. And I just, I, I, don't know, I will not forget the looks on their faces of astonishment. They were like, you know, just, I, don't, I can't even remember what it, the conversation was, but they were stunned that God had seen and heard that conversation and he spoke it to them. And he, he was going off and sharing all these words. And finally, he's like, okay, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. 
handed the mic to me. He's like, Brian, you got anything to share? I'm like, oh my gosh. You really want me to follow that up? I mean, you really want me to go after you? Just have told people their conversations driving down Interstate 40. And I, I didn't remember what I said. Like, Jesus loves you? I mean, it was like so bad. But, you know, I, you know so my point is, my, my, my point is this, is that even though we have the indwelling Holy Spirit and we need to live by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, we also must have the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can carry on the ministry of Jesus. Amen. So um, let's turn to let's turn to uh, first or second Timothy chapter one verse six. Second Timothy chapter one verse six. Paul says to stir up the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe this is a very relevant word for us at Restoration Life. God wants to kindle afresh the gift of God. 2 Timothy 1.6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And, and even in verse 7, this is kind of what we sing about. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. In other words, what had happened in Timothy is, is Paul had laid hands on him and imparted to him a spiritual gift. We don't know exactly what that gift was. Perhaps it was prophecy. Perhaps it was, who knows? We don't know what it was. It was a gift of the Spirit. And if you look at the Greek word, this Greek word actually means that, it actually means that, that to, to stir up again the gift until it is alive and burning with fire. So in other words, what, what Paul's saying here is this gift that's in you is like an ember. It's barely burning. And God wants to rekindle that gift. God wants to burn again that gift inside of you. And I, I believe that's a word, real, a real emphasis God wants to speak to us today, is God wants to rekindle the gifts of God Upon us. Now, I don't know what your gifts are. It could be a million different things, but I, I do know that just the, the cares of life, you know, weigh down on us. Warfare, the busyness of life, anxiety, paying the bills, discouragement, financial challenges, health challenges. You know, even, even the Lord directing your attention, like for me, the Lord really directed my attention to focus on God's eternal purpose that even focusing on those things God puts you, wants you to focus on, even focusing on those things can, can cause that fire, that, that burning ember, that ember to become just that, that, faint, that faint spark, that God wants to fan the flame. God wants to rekindle those gifts so that we can accomplish God's purpose. See, God gives us gifts God gives us these gifts because we need these gifts to do what God's called us to do and to advance his kingdom. In fact, we're going to give an account to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the parable of the talents. We're going to give an account of the at the judgment seat of Christ for how we took the gifts God gave us. I mean, it could be a million different things. It could be spiritual gifts, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. It could be things like speaking or writing or singing or music, whatever it is. We're going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ for how we took those gifts God gave us and whether or not we buried them or multiplied them. That's why we need to stir afresh those gifts. We need to stir afresh those gifts so they can grow and increase. So we can't do what God has called us to do without the gifts God has given us. God doesn't give us gifts to entertain us or to make a service interesting. God gives us gifts to accomplish his eternal purpose, to advance his kingdom. So, you know, what are some of the things that God wants to stir up here? What's some of the things God wants to stir up within us? You know, praying and singing in tongues. That would be one. That's why I was in the worship time. Okay, let's pray and sing the Spirit. God does not, you know, we need the, God gives us the gift of tongues to commune with him and to fellowship with him. And to, it says, the, it makes the mind unfruitful. So we need that, those gifts, stir up the gifts, pray and sing in tongues. See, praying and singing in tongues 
makes the natural mind unfruitful, but then all of a sudden spiritual thoughts start coming that you could not have received. Spiritual songs start coming that you could not have sung without that singing or praying in the Spirit. So what are some other things? Prophetic gifts of the Holy Spirit. Words of knowledge, prophesying, words of wisdom. Now that doesn't mean everyone is going to, you know, I remember when I first started seeing Jeff Burke minister, he was called the laughing prophet and he would, he, would, he would prophesy over people and he would rhyme, but it would be like, you know, stunningly accurate. The, the, the rhyme was stunningly accurate. And I was thinking back in my mid-20s, okay, well, if I'm going to be a prophet like that, I've got to rhyme too. And so, you know, back then I would like start trying to do that. And it was like basically like the stupidest things that would come out. But you don't have to try to emulate anyone else and think, okay, well, I'm going to be this. Be yourself. Be yourself. Be who God's made you to be with the gifts God has given you. And, and don't, but, but at the same time, Paul said to earnestly desire the gifts. Now, that's, you would think that would be the last thing Paul would say to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were carnal. They were jealous. They were, they were you know, th there was immorality in the church. There was all kind of carnality going on in the church. And Paul said, no, desire earnestly the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Sometimes people think, well, I don't want to, I feel like if I desire earnestly the gifts, it's going to take my focus away from Jesus. Now, certainly that could be the case. I'm not saying that can never happen. Certainly that could be the case. But I don't think any of us here have remotely that problem or that thing to worry about. Some of the extreme charismatic churches certainly have taken their eyes off Jesus Christ and focused on the gifts. I don't think anyone here is remotely close to that. So it is not going to take your focus upon G away from Jesus to pursue the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the next thing, stir up deliverance from demons, that we would have discerning of spirits to cast out and drive out demons. Uh, a stirring up of worship, a stirring up of the forerunner call that God has given us to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I mean, if you haven't noticed, the church desperately needs to be made ready. We need that stirring up of those gifts of the forerunner call to make the church ready. Our call is a house of prayer for the nations. Our call to train and equip. All those different things. God wants to stir up those gifts within us whether they're natural gifts, whether they're spirit-empowered gifts, whether they're gifts of the Spirit, God wants to stir those up so that we can be the expression of the body of Christ to advance the kingdom of God and to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen? You still there? So the third thing, the third thing Pentecost tells us is the importance of gathering together as a local church. I don't think I've ever noticed this before, but preparing for this message, I, I looked at it, it just leaped off the page to me how often the word together was mentioned. I mean, it just was like, I've never seen that. How often the word together was mentioned in Acts 1 through 2. For example, um, in Acts chapter 1, it was mentioned three times. In Acts chapter 2, it was mentioned four times. So seven times in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, the word together is mentioned to highlight the need of the ecclesia coming together, the church of Jesus Christ coming together. See, you can experience personal revival because the indwelling spirit is in you. You can experience personal revival because the reviver is inside of you. But you cannot experience corporate revival without gathering together corporately with the local church. I mean, it just has stunned me how, how just essential the local church gathering is because God only pours out corporately when the church is gathered corporately. There's some things God will not do, just you and Jesus in your prayer closet. Amen. So Pentecost tells us of the utter importance of the, of the gathering together of the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, 57% of the time in the book of Acts, I did this search, 57% of the time in the book of Acts, the word together is mentioned to describe the coming together of the church of Jesus Christ. So my point is the ecclesia of Jesus Christ, the gathering together of Jesus Christ is of utter importance. 
The fourth thing that Pentecost tells us is that only the Holy Spirit can heal the racial and ethnic division that's splintering the nations at this present time. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we are deeply divided. I would say America is probably more divided or we have not been this divided since the Civil War. I mean, we are deeply divided along racial, political, religious, cultural, ethnic lines. I mean, tremendous division has crept in to the, to the nation. And tremendous division has crept into the church. Pentecost reminds us God's solution to it. God's solution is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You, we will never be able to, with a million arguments, try to bring, and I'm not saying there's not a need for, for good, persuasive discussion and debate, but we will never be able to bring the unity that God wants to bring apart from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that when you, when you read about Pentecost, is let's actually turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. It's so interesting. You, you may not have never ever seen as you may have, but Luke is writing, and Luke says, now, he's describing what's happening. So basically, the diaspora had scattered the Jews to the nations because of the Roman invasion and different, and different invasions, different conquering nations. And so the Jews had scattered into the nations, but they would come back. They would come back during Pentecost or Passover or whenever the feast would come. Now, now that's what Luke's writing about. He says, now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. That doesn't mean that people from Fiji came or people from Australia came. It meant from that geographic area that was known to the ancient world, the first century world, the Jews gathered from the nations back to Jerusalem. And it says that when the, when the sound came and that, you know, the, the apostles, they, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues. Now, I don't believe that this coming of, the, of Pentecost is the same kind of prayer language we get in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This was, they were, the, the tongues of fire rested on them, and Peter would, for example, start to speak in Italian, or Paul, or not Paul, but John started to speak in French. I don't even know if they had French back then, but uh, whatever the language was back then. But it would be like, okay, we're gathering together, and the Holy Spirit comes, and there's this multi cultural, multi-language group of people that speaks all kinds of... It's like if I was going to the United Nations and the Holy Spirit came upon me and the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon me, I just started speaking. People in, in China would hear it in Chinese. People in you know, uh, France would hear it in French or Greek would hear it in... You know, Greece would hear it in Greek. So it's not like there was a need for interpretation. It was the... the language, as they spoke in tongues, it was actually the native language that the Jewish people spoke. And so a lot of commentators look at this and they say, you know what? Pentecost reversed the curse of Babel. And Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is the only solution to the division in the nations. You think about this is just even reading about this, John Stott was talking about this in his commentary. He says, he says that Luke includes in his list descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth and gives us in Acts 2 a table of the nations comparable to the one in Genesis chapter 10. That's so interesting. In other words, Genesis chapter 10 is right before the Tower of Babel. The nations gathered in Babel and they said, we are going to build a tower that reaches up into heaven. And God said, yeah, no, you're not. I'm going to come down and I'm going to bring judgment and I'm going to confuse your languages and scatter you abroad. Pentecost reverses that. The nations gather together. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And then everyone begins to hear the apostles speaking about the mighty deeds of God in their own language because God reversed the curse of Babel. And I believe in our day, you know, in America, racism, you know, whatever, this, this, whatever you could pick, racism, politics, 
theology. Just, I mean, it's, it's just so polarized in so every way. I mean, it's almost like you can't even talk because you might say something that might offend somebody. And to be honest, I don't think anyone wants that division. Pro I mean, well, some probably do, but a lot of people don't want that division. And I believe this message of Pentecost is so relevant right now for the church of Jesus Christ when it's being splintered into several divisions, being splintered along the lines of race, along the lines of theology, along the lines of politics, along the lines of culture and ideology. And all of this is that the, the solution, and again, that doesn't mean there's not discussion, there's not debates, there's not ideas that need to be refuted. I'm not saying any of that. But the ultimate solution to the division that came uh, at Babel is Pentecost, and the ultimate solution that is in our current crisis is God's outpouring of his spirit. It's going to take the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to heal a divided nation. It's going to take the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to heal a divided church. It's going to take the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring about the unity that Jesus said and Jesus prayed for in John 17, which I believe with all my heart will be answered before he comes back. Father, make your church, I'm paraphrasing, make your church one even as we are one. God is going to pour out his spirit yet again. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29. Just if you read the context very, very closely, it specifically says the Holy Spirit will be poured out before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. I believe we're moving into a time that some of the, prophet, some of the prophets have called God's going to pour out his spirit in a Pentecost that will out Pentecost Pentecost. At the end of the age, God is going to pour out his spirit in such a way that the, the fulfillment of Joel 2, 28 through 29 is going to be fulfilled. I never have, I've never ever believed that Joel 2, 28 through 20, Joel 2, 28 through 29 was fulfilled fully in the first century. I believe partially it was fulfilled, but I believe if you, if you closely examine the Old Testament context, it clearly reveals there are certain conditions that must have to happen, and I won't get into all that now, that has to happen before the Spirit of God is poured out. My point is, not only has the Spirit of God been poured out, not only have we received a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we need fresh baptisms of the, of the Holy Spirit, even though we have the indwelling Spirit of God. But there's coming upon the end time church before Jesus comes back. I have no idea when it's going to be. God, let it be soon. But I have no idea when this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming. But I do know there is coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we have never seen before, even greater than the book of Acts. And I want to be part of that. Now, I don't want to live always looking out to that and not living from the incredible treasure God's already given me. I want to live in the fullness of what I can have right now in the fullness of what God has given right now while also contending for that which he is going to pour out. See, the church of Jesus Christ needs the authentic moving of the Spirit of God to bring healing, authentic healing like Jesus did back into the church like they had in the first century. I mean, I'm not sure what's going to happen at the end of the age, but if the healthcare system is shaken in America, we are going to need the healing power of God. We're going to need miracles, signs, and wonders. We're going to need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to minister like Jesus did. We're going to need Luke uh, 4.18, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has anointed me to set free those who are captive. He has anointed me to heal those who are blind, and He has anointed me to set up those who are oppressed free. We need that anointing that doesn't just come up from in us, but is on us for the ministry of Jesus so that we might continue the ministry of Jesus and, and John, I think John 14, 12, I believe that Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. Now, there, that, that, 
I don't even think you can look at the first century church and say they did greater works than Jesus. But I believe that before Jesus comes back, the end time church will be doing greater works than Jesus. I want to be part of that if I'm still, old, if I'm still around. I hope you do too. And, you know, be growing up in a charismatic, you know, being in the charismatic movement for 20 something years, 25 years, whatever it is, charismatics have, you know, such a tendency to, you know, such a hunger for the supernatural and such a hunger for the, the moving of the spirit and such a hunger for healing and miracles that we can, you know, stretch the truth some and say people were healed and like, yeah, if you really investigate it, they weren't. I'm not talking about this kind of like stretched half truth. I'm talking about the miracle working power of God that is absolutely undebatable. And, and, and so, you know, you've heard the story a million times, but some haven't. So, but when we were in Africa, I was, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, I had a taste of the, the powers of the age to come. In fact, I would have also told them, those uh, charismatic, non-charismatic ministers, this story. Um, but, you know, you, do you not realize that I am the ring finger healer? You know, you're talking to the ring finger healer, and you know what I'm talking about. But we were, in, we were in Kenya, and I had preached a message. And anyway, I forget even what the, the, word, the word the Lord gave was that God wanted to set people free from intimidation or fear or low self-esteem or something like that. So I, was, I had the people come up, and there was a line of people. We were praying for them. And as I started praying for them, you know, I prayed for this one. I prayed for that one. I mean, honestly, it felt nothing. It was no, no not even nothing. It was just like totally dead. I'm like, okay, well, I guess this means we'll get back to the hotel and get to eat sooner. So that's good. But anyway, I get to this one lady and all of a sudden I pray for her. And I don't know why, I guess I was, I don't know why I was praying for her this way, but I had my finger out like this and was touching her forehead and the electricity of God came through me and my finger and she started shaking. And I was like, whoa, I've never experienced that. At first, just to be honest, I thought I was being electrocuted. Um, I thought, okay, here I am in Africa. Maybe their electrical systems aren't very up to standard, and the microphone is shocking me. And so anyway, I said, okay, well, maybe, maybe this is actually God. So I went back to the first person and started praying, nothing, 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 nothing. Get to this lady again, and this time I really thought I was being electrocuted. The surge of electricity came through me so strong in this one lady. This, this one finger was burning, and my heart was racing, and it was like the electricity of God. It was the power of God. It was like being sticking your finger in an electrical outlet. Not that I've ever done that, but it's like sticking your finger right into that. And the power of God, the surge of God came upon me. The power of God came upon me. And this lady, she began to shake and she fell down in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, they, and my friend was telling me, Moses was telling me that she was so drunk in the Holy Spirit, they literally had to carry her home because she could not walk. And again, I'm not exaggerating. I don't get into exaggeration at all. Maybe sometimes in telling stories, but this was not an exaggeration. Um, <laughs> Moses told me, okay, she was instantly set free from witchcraft. She was instantly set free from abuse, and she, God brought her through deliverance. And now that, she, now that she went through that, she's now teaching a women's Bible study or something like that. But God set her free in that one, that one moment. My point is I tasted the power of God. And I want that power. We need that power, not for charismatic entertainment, not to build a ministry. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ and to do his works and continue what he started. It was never meant to end. Acts 1.1 tells us all that Jesus began to do and teach. We need that power. I know if, if I operated in that power in fact, after that, I was thinking, okay, everyone I'm, everyone I'm going to touch is going to get electrocuted. Everyone, I, okay, hold the babies, okay, because if I, if I touch this baby, this baby might just fall out of his parents' his mother's arms. Hold the babies. No, cancer, it can't stand to this, okay, but it's never happened again. But my point is this. The power of the age to come, we can taste of that power and how the end-time church needs that power once again to heal the sick, cast out demons, prophesy with accuracy, and to minister in the gifts of the Spirit with signs, wonders, and miracles. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so to bring this message to a conclusion, 
Pentecost tells us we need to live from the power we've already got. We need to kindle afresh what has already been given to us. We need to receive the baptisms of the Holy Spirit that he gives now. We need to contend for the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit he will give in the final generation before the Lord's return. And we need to understand that the church is vital to this corporate anointing of power God wants to release. And finally, this is how Jesus is going to bring about the unity he prayed for, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for what Pentecost means, Lord. Jesus, we tell you, Father, we tell you, we want, we want to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ with power. I thank you that we don't have to choose either or. This is both and. We can have the indwelling Holy Spirit and we can have the power for ministry. We can have both. And I ask you, Father, even as we listen to this message, that you would stir afresh, even those that would listen online, those that would listen in person, Lord, you would stir afresh the gifts of God that were imparted to us by the laying on of hands. Stir up, Lord, stir up those gifts that we might be activated and stirred up with power, we ask, Lord. And I pray that in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to end the online portion now.